Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. We got beat out. Boy, ball breakdown. Coach Nick. Doc Rivers coaching problem. You know he got fired. Hopefully, if he still wants to coach in... Hold up. Hopefully, if he still wants to coach in the NBA, there's a chance for him. It might have surprised a lot of people that Doc Rivers was fired yesterday. But if you listen closely enough to some sound bites, there were subtle hints being dropped. You said the ball didn't get to you. Does the coach call plays to try to... Get oh, this is from last season. They lost to the Heat last year. This is from last season. Next question. He said next question. How has your relationship been with Doc and... So he's telling me Harden got the coach fired once again. <laughs> now he didn't get the coach in Houston fired. The one before Mike D'Antoni. I think it was Kevin McHale. Uh, yeah, okay. Our relationship is okay. It's, it's a lot of one I want to say, but yeah, just it's frustrating. James Harden was not all that supportive of Doc Rivers in his press conference yesterday. One person said to me, it'd be hard for me to see James wanting to come back and play for Doc again. This has been a subject I've wanted to explore. Bro, why is your tongue sticking out? Time. How good a coach is Doc Rivers? He won Coach of the Year award in his very first year with the Magic, leading a malformed roster of misfits to a 500 record with the win improvement of eight games, beating out two other coaches who appeared to squeeze a lot more out of their teams. My Orlando team is the HC. No one gives me credit for getting out. <laughs> this man wants credit, bro. Murray, you have a championship. Why are you complaining? Since who won the title. That was an HC. Go look at the... I want you to go back and look at that roster. Yikes. I, I dare you to go back and look at that roster. And you would say, what a hell of a coaching job. Really? <laughs> now he's throwing his players under the bus, bro. Now he's throwing his players under the bus. I dare you go back That's what interview I was talking about. He got defensive. You see how defensive he was when they asked him about his job? Look at that This roster. is the interview right here. You would say, what a hell of a coaching job. Really? Really? This is borderline disingenuous, since his team did have prime Tracy McGrady, and that Pistons team did not win the title that year. In fact, they didn't have Rasheed Wallace yet and had to change coaches to beat the Lakers in 2004. Doc Rivers has always been what we used to call a player's coach, a former player who could connect with the roster on a personal level and know how to motivate them since he was one of them. Doc, you think Ben Simmons can, can still be a point guard for, for a championship team like the one you guys want to become? Yeah, David, I don't know that question or the answer to that right now. Um, oof. You know, so I don't know the answer to that. But if he was willing to be this unsupportive of his starting guard in public, you have to wonder what he said to the team in private. Part of being this kind of player coach is to leave it to his players to quote unquote make the plays. And Rasheed Wallace gave us some insight, having played for Doc in Boston. Get Glenn out of there. You got to get somebody in there that the players respect. He doesn't make adjustments. That's just from being in the locker room with him for that one season. That seems to always be his biggest knock. If his team is up, you don't really have to coach shit then. When you in the trenches and you going against another team and another good coach, you got to be more than a locker room manager. He depends more on the players to make those adjustments. But that coach also, you have to come in there and make adjustments as well, especially if what you're trying hasn't worked. And when we were in Boston, as far as the players out there on the floor, we were the one that made the adjustment. All right, come out the huddle. Right before we get on the floor, we huddle up like, all right, look, yo. Nope. Hey, fuck that. We're going to do this. Boom, 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 boom. For the way that Glenn is, he's not that hard-nosed coach that we need. No. That's me. If I was a coach, I'd be that type of coach, that hard-nosed coach. I'm hard-nosed with y'all, am I? To believe me. Now look. So if a guy who played for him is saying this, then perhaps Doc is tired and out of energy. And I don't blame him, considering he's continuously coached for 24 straight seasons, which is why he's- 24 straight seasons, Doc! Drinking Athletic Greens, a nutritional drink that boosts energy and mental- And take a year off. Purchase. Take a lesson from the scoop shot by Jokic and try one scoop a day from AG1. A big issue with him was how he carried himself on the sidelines, especially <laughs> was an affront to humanity. What is you doing? A big show of negative emotion that the players would feed off of, and it would completely affect their play. Man about to get arrested, bro. That man got arrested. How his teams fare in the playoffs. And while his regular season winning record ranks 32nd in percentage, his playoff record is a bit closer to average. Of course, injuries have played a major role in some of his playoff runs, but that happens to every coach. 
Doc has coached in a league leading 16 Game 7s throughout his career, and his record does not compare favorably to many of the great coaches. Even at home, he barely broke 500, despite the home team winning over 75% of the time overall. Even worse, 10 of his 11 losses in Game 7s were blowouts. So I decided to examine the moment each of these games fell apart to see if there was a theme. It quickly became apparent that his teams consistently melted down amidst a flurry of turnovers, bad shots, and confounding defense. When the other team started to get going, they fell apart. For a coach who puts the fate of his team in the players' hands as much as Doc does, it's hard to ignore the through line of mental collapses that continually plagued his teams. And like, I'll put the game in the players' hands because obviously they out there playing, but I'll, I ain't going down without a fight. I'm that type of coach. I, we ain't going down without a fight. We ain't going to be getting blown out in game sevens. We ain't getting blown out. We going out. We going out. We going out strong, okay? We going out swinging. Never, never that. On the road or at home, especially not at home. No, our home crowd don't deserve that, man. Bunch of his game seven losses because the evidence begins to mount. We need look no further than three days ago when they lost in grand fashion to the Celtics on the road, going small against the two bigs of the Celtics and exploiting the mismatch from behind. He got PJ Tucker at center, bro. Starting in the second quarter was against Robert Williams and Al Horford. They probably put Harden at center. Really fell apart on both ends of the floor. Despite Harden spinning Brown all the way around in transition, he not only just drops the ball out of bounds, but flails into Brown's face, earning him a deserved flagrant foul, turning a potentially solid nine-point lead into a measly four-point dogfight as Niang doesn't bump down in the roll man and Tatum lobs for the easy dunk. This man's concerned about Horford. This is what I was talking about right there. Niang! This man goes to Horford instead of Robert Williams wide open at the rim. The role man and Tatum you ain't concerned about the old man or the dude that's gonna dunk the ball. Come on, the earth. That's why you got played out the series, bro. That's why you got unplayable. Unplayable. But the unraveling continued in spectacular fashion. Wanna guard old people Max instead of people that can get an easy dunk. Okay. But look where he bounces it. Not even midway between him and Harden. And it was never open anyway as Brown pounces on it and gets all the way to the hoop for a layup. You know what's crazy? I saw something on Bleacher Report. It was going to be like a four-team trade between the Spurs, the 76ers, the uh, Wizards, and the Rockets. And the Rockets get James Harden. The Spurs get Joel Embiid and Bradley Beal. You know, and uh, um, the 76ers get the number one pick, Victor. And, 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 Ty, and they still got Tyrese. Then the Wizards get Tobias. Like, that's a great trade. I, I, I wish that trade would uh, happen in real life, man. Pop gets Bradley Bill and Embiid. The Sixers get the number one pick. Win Ben Yeye with Tyrese Maxey and Jalen Green. And they get Jalen Green, too. That's a good rebuild right there for the 76ers. Good rebuild. Harden goes back to Houston where he wants to be. Out as Harden just dribbles it to Robert Williams. And on the other end, that's a great trade. That's just a great trade for the NBA, in my opinion. They should do that. Defensive position, okay, but at this point, Tatum already has 14 points and wants to get cooking. Why isn't PJ Tucker parking himself on that left block with Embiid zoning up the backside with Williams in the dunker spot? As a result, he's not there when Tatum spins and there's no help to stop the layup from going in. I have no problem with going down low to Embiid, although for the series, Horford had pretty much manhandled him one-on-one, -on -one, and he promptly blows the little bunny hook. Before we continue documenting this meltdown, I want to take a trip back in time to a few other Game 7s that Doc has coached in, since there are a number that had similar results, and it feels like there's a theme here. In 2003, while coaching the Magic, they were hanging tough until the second quarter when they get into full scramble mode because they kind of double, but really, DeClerc is just standing there, giving Tayshaun Prince a decent look. Tracy McGrady comes right back down and then blows this lob without any defensive pressure on him. Then they help foolishly from one pass away see. off the corner to the guy who had just catapulted one three-pointer in already, and he increases the lead to seven. And then a little bit later, they allow middle penetration way too easily, and it opens up a wide-open shot for Prince that just about ended the game here. These game sevens are riddled with mistakes made from the pressure of the moment more so than what Doc's opponents were doing. Let's cut to 2005 against the Pacers, where just like in 03, this downward spiral starts by giving up I a can't see it. pointer as Paul Pierce falls asleep and lets Stephen Jackson swish one to increase the lead. Next, Pierce comes off that pin down on the left side, and Jackson just pokes it away, which forced him to foul in transition. Paul Pierce getting, got two more points from the Paul Pierce getting clamped up by Stephon Jackson. It was Ricky Davis's turn to try a foolish wraparound pass with no space inside, as the Celtics are unraveling before our eyes. 
A little later, when you need the defense to be on point, Delonte West decides to neither double nor guard his man, hovering in no man's land as they give up an easy layup, and this was before Tom Thibodeau got there to take over this side of the floor. They try to do it again with an almost equally ineffective double of the post. No one can get close to the shooter, and an 11 point lead in this game is practically a blow. That's Reggie Miller. Is that Reggie Miller? I know that ain't Reggie Miller. No one can get close to the shooter, and an 11 point Yo, lead Reggie Miller. in this game you is sure practically retire. a blowout. But it kept getting worse. <laughs> there isn't anyone guarding Davis in the perimeter, yet he just forces this pass into the post on a terrible angle. And to end the game early in the fourth, they offer help on the ISO from the one guy you can't help off of. The pass is too easy, the shot too open, and it's another Game 7 blowout for a Doc coach team. We finally get to some HD footage by 2009 when Orlando ends the defending champ season in the second round. As a coach, this is HD. He's the SD. quality of shot they get, but this is Kendrick Perkins, who never met a blown layup in his life. Yo, Perkins, Perkins, I'm not. Yo, and he talks all that shit on ESPN. Dude came and make a layup, bro. <laughs> I'm not taking nothing he said seriously no more. I was going back to this clip, bro. I can't argue Look. with the quality of shot they get, but this not one, is Kendrick Perkins, not two, who never met a not layup three. He didn't like. <laughs> Yo, you got clamped up by the White Howard. He wasn't even there. Interesting how three point shots tended to start the meltdowns for Doc's team in game Perk, you can't and escape, Perk. Defense by Ray Allen, but Mikhail Petrus came to play. All that old Orlando Magic team. What you know about Petrus? Jameer Nelson. Petrus, Rashad Lewis, Turkaloo, and the White Howard. The Magic were one of the early modern offenses with plenty of shooters and lots and of And coach Stan Van Gundy. And closeouts. So credit to the Celtics defense for good rotations all around. Good old Until days, Allen the good old days. Courtney Lee as he's getting blown by for the end one. The game is getting out of hand and you're at home, so a timeout was probably warranted, but at least during the free throw, make sure Paul Pierce is going to get his hands on the ball. Instead, it's a ridiculous Ricky Davis, Kendrick Perkins pick and roll, and I'm just embarrassed that Perk even tried this on Dwight freaking Howard. <laughs> He got blocked eight times in a row, Perk. Don't say nothing. Don't talk trash on ESPN ever again. Down court, forcing Perkins into a mismatch. And despite Lee doing a curly kneel impression from the Globetrotters, they catch two defenders rotating to the ball and another drive to pull up, and the Celtics have cracked. They end it completely off this skip pass when all Big Baby has to do is catch the ball that's basically thrown right at him. Instead, Dwight makes the two free throws, and the route is on. Over and over again, these are examples of what a team looks like when it's not very well coached. You may remember this slugfest in the 2010 finals, and while it wasn't a blowout, Game 7 is Game 7, right? It had all the hallmark mistakes of a Doc coach team. Here's Game 7. I remember this vividly, vividly. Seven. This game was a slugfest, bruh. None of these teams reached to 70 points. None of them. Rondo helps one pass away off of Derek Fisher of all people, and a three is like six points in a low scoring game like this one. Yeah. But mental mistakes still happened. What in the world did Pierce think was going to happen with this fake attempt at taking a charge? <laughs> he should have tried to rip him. This is Ball Pierce. What is you doing, bro? You my favorite small board of all time, too. What in the world? This is my favorite small board of all time, oh, too. Rip him. It's Pal Gasol. Bring the ball up the court. Rip him. What think was going to happen with this fake Y'all don't think. Y'all got to think. Oh, oh, it's Pau Gasol. He's a power forward. Uh, uh, back then, power forwards didn't bring the ball up the court. I should probably rip him because he's going to most likely. He's, if I don't rip, he's going to pick up his dribble and probably travel. Taking a charge. Think. But after that, how in the world? Did just a little bit. Up? Just a little. Please. Who they were guarding. He's giving me a headache watching Doc's team. <laughs> Bro, Doc is giving me a headache. KG has no idea where he's going. Wandering around for to the corner seconds, and then not switching with Rondo. Now he's stuck dealing with Gasol on the roll, and there's oh my goodness, no way. <laughs> he, so Rondo's guarding his man, Rondo's guarding his man, Rondo. and he's guarding Rondo's man. Now he's stuck dealing with Gasol on the roll, yep. and there's, there's no way Rondo is keeping him off the boards here after the Kobe miss, yeah. And this led to the free throws that ended the game. Wow. In the last game he coached for the Celtics, I can acknowledge they were outgunned versus the Heatles in 2012, but here we were anyway in a game seven. They took the Heat to game seven as well with LeBron. Anything could happen. And Paul Pierce lets Dwayne Wade just take his cookies from him. In a crucial moment when you know that LeBron was A, going to ISO, and B, make the open pass, KG shouldn't be helping one pass away off the corner here. It's Pierce's help. So James makes the easy pass and Bosch takes the easy shot to start the blowout. 
The Celtics got a lot of mileage out of the Ray Allen ball screen for Pierce and the flare screen, but what is the spacing on the other side? Bass and Rondo bring their men right to the hoop to not only block the shot, but it goes out of bounds off of Pierce. They never really figured out how to get KG in proper help positions. He should have switched with Pierce here so he could be in the lane to try and stop LeBron. Instead, he shoots this one on the way down over the effective contest from Pierce. Now they got Paul Pierce as a run protector. Doc Rivers really had Paul Pierce as a run protector. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Paul Pierce just like Jokic. He just shorter. Uh, Paul Pierce can't even do a calf raise. In the last ditch effort to post up Come on, KG Doc. LeBron guarding him, Pierce is smart not to try a lob. Why aren't they flashing the high post to get a quick high-low pass to him? Instead, Rondo basically ends the game with this silly lob attempt that Bosch was all over the second he released it. And out of the timeout, Rondo doesn't run the play that was called, which was to get it to Pierce coming off this flare screen. He simply wasn't the guy you wanted creating in this situation, and Bosch shows us why. It's the 2015 Clippers Rocket Series, and if we're talking meltdowns, this one was Doc's worst. We have to mention Game 6 because the Clippers got outscored 51-20 to over the final 15 minutes of the game after having a big lead, and that was without James Harden on the floor for a second of the fourth quarter. You could just see how the team was shell-shocked and broken amidst a cascade of mental mistakes that fed from one to the next. And while they hung tough till the third quarter of Game 7, the residual effects were about to end their season. As the Rockets bring DeAndre Jordan up in the pick and roll, Redick allows Harden to reject the screen, which means Jordan is out of position to protect the rim, and here we go again. Blake gets into the lane very deliberately, but tries a contested lefty jump hook, which misses wildly. I'm sure he was still thinking about it on the way back down instead of picking up the guy. Look how fast Harden used to be. Harden's not this fast no more. On the way back Man, down. the good old days. Now, Look how fast he used to run. Who had cut their hearts out in game six, leading to the wide open triple. Going through these games, you can just tell when it's happening as Chris Paul throws this ridiculous pass out of bounds. It's hard to see the beginning of the play, but it takes way too long for the remaining three Clippers to hustle back down the court, and as a result, Jordan has left the guard Prigioni and Redick on Dwight. DJ doesn't even really help here, just puts himself in a terrible position for the easy pass out and wide open three. Better help is great Coaching sounds about better a help. very busy schedule. Get therapy wherever you are. You will often hear Doc say his teams didn't trust each other enough. Well, that's the coach's responsibility. As Blake's team... Doc, teachers didn't, they didn't cooperate. Who's, whose fault is that? It's not the player's fault. That's your fault. That's part of being a coach. Have your team cooperate and, you know what I'm saying, get on the same page. Enough. Well, that's the coach's responsibility. As Blake's teammates leave him with no rotational support and Smith scores again. This was her last chance to do something. That's why you're the coach. From the sideline. If you don't think this was a team in panic mode based on this play, well... Because the team is a whole bunch of talent. There's a whole bunch of great talent. A coach makes it in to put, put that talent on the same page. Make them into one time to win a championship. Well, That's your really job, Doc. To tell you. And this is why we have put everyone on the same page. Their teams avoid these situations. And yet this Clippers team would allow... This is what we're going to do. Okay, this is what we're going to do. If this doesn't work, then we're going to do this. If this doesn't work, then we're going to do this. If this doesn't work, then we're going to do this. You got it? We all got to be on the same page. Until the game was over early. Let me take you to the bubble, where another three-pointer sparks the run that turned to Doc Rivers' coach game. We're really going to do all his blown game sevens, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! I thought the video was over after that. Easily steals it. On the way back down, everything seems okay. Hopefully, Doc gets another job in the NBA, though. Real talk. If he still wants to coach. Same person. PG sends Pat Bev to the weak side, but then doubles the post. Kawhi is frozen as the Nuggets get a wide open cut to the hoop. Down one, George falls asleep getting around the simple pin down. He said George Paul. <laughs> he said George Paul. It should be no surprise that the Nuggets love to hit Jokic in the short roll from Murray, yet they decide to rotate from the strong side corner. Kawhi falls asleep for a step, and the lead is growing. I'm not sure why Montrez Harrell was even playing at this point since he had been neutralized. This man's ice on. Montrez Harrell's isolating in a clutch of a game seven. Montrez! And this time, yeah, Doc. Properly out of the uh, ball, Doc, Doc, Doc. Recognizing he needed to contest the wing three, and the lead is nine. And their last gasp chance to get back in the game ends with a blown layup. They even almost Lou Williams eating too many chicken wings. Three, but Murray is able to track it down and give him credit for hitting this tough one. But the Clippers never recover, scoring only two points in seven minutes and losing by 15, which causes Doc to be fired from the Clippers. He quickly headed over to Philadelphia. The same thing happened the next year. What did he do? 
Thunder. They're the number one seed in the East, playing the fifth seeded Hawks in the second round. Here's the moment. Trey Young gets the flyby and hits the 16 footer to cut the Sixers lead to two midway through the fourth. Then Herter pulls up over a much shorter Curry for another midi to tie it. They want to go down low in the post, but the only play they really run for him is a pin down for Curry and then turn around to post up instead of some sort of cross screen or even rolling from a ball screen to the post. As a result, Capella can blow this up easily and look where he has to go to get the ball. It's ridiculous they try to run the play again with no time on the shot clock and Harris has to create something on his <laughs> They try to run a whole play with two seconds left on the clock. What did he do? They Doc! Hit. The Trey Young floater killed the Y'all can see your action earlier. Primarily you gotta have plan B's, C's, sevens, plan sevens, eights, a thousands, Z's, Y's, X. You gotta have so many plans, Doc. You only boy got like one or two or three. Because MB wouldn't step up. If the play doesn't work, then you just gonna throw up some bullshit at the shot clock. Bro, it doesn't work like that. You gotta have multiple, multiple, I mean multiple plans. High enough to contest. And here he goes again on automatic pilot. They continued to leave Curry in for his shooting, but it meant that Herder could feast as the smaller Curry just couldn't do anything more than this to stop him. And then we get to the infamous Simmons post up. He gets a layup. Oh, not shooting, this. Not so this. The Sixers only come away with one point from the five ball three yards. With the Hawks left to chase down a loose ball, why is Harris chasing Young out to the half court line? The only oh, way to get goodness. a chance to score is to pull yourself out of position he lost like a ball. this, and the rest of the defense can't recover. Look at this ridiculous spacing as they don't get MP in the block, but hope he can create a good shot with his back to the basket from the elbow. He goes up weak and the end is near. As you have to wonder why Doc's team struggled to get big plays from his stars so consistently. Why do we keep seeing the other team raise their level of concentration so consistently to make the game winning plays? It certainly doesn't help when you see one of the biggest mistakes of the playoffs made here as Thibault tries to contest from behind and I nails Carter in the head for three free throws. It wasn't surprising to see Doc call for an ISO out top for Embiid instead of near the basket, and it also wasn't surprising to see him meekly turn it over on a spin move to end the game. And that brings us to the end of the Celtics game, where they force Embiid to switch on to Tatum, and I don't blame him for getting blown by, Tatum can do that to anybody, but look at the body language, the end is near. If Doc can't recognize this is the moment, he will soon, as Harden could shoot the layup, but does generate an open look that Tucker has been hot on, but it's not even close. On the blind pick action, Embiid has no choice but to switch on to Tatum, who's scorching at this point, and check the bench. They literally freak out trying to get someone else to come trap in the corner, but no one budges in that direction as he nails another three. Here's another example of someone on the other team lighting it up on a Doc coach team, as Embiid again can't do anything on this rainbow. You know what's crazy, too? To load up MB Look at the shot clock. <laughs> it's winding down. It's like at three seconds, two, three. It's at three, two, one. On this rainbow. That's crazy. The Celtics continue to load up on the Harden MB pick and roll. And the Sixers never came up with anything to combat it. That's what I'm saying. You got to have something to combat that. You want to run beat or oh, beat and be beat and Harden pick and roll going to be unstoppable. Okay, they're going to start loading up on it. What you going to do? Maxi needs to be cutting baseline here, and this looks so haphazard as they try to run a ball screen right into where Harden is. I'm gonna standing. try it again. The ball gets deflected, and they get the worst Versus. possible outcome you could possibly get. Short. Doc gets his plays from 2K, bro. Doc plays 2K and say, "Oh yeah, we're gonna get that play. We're gonna get that play." But pick six turnover. <laughs> What's that called? Floppy one, one floppy series. two, pick and roll, ISO. They just stood around and let Embiid isolate on him from the wing. Nor was it surprising that Horford blocked yet another one of his shots. How about and block my old man, man. Sleep on Tatum? I guess he was hoping someone else would run over there to help, but it's now a 15 point lead. We can't see what's going on other than a three on four where Harden just loses the ball and then falls down while throwing it out of bounds here before completely falling apart by not even being in the front court when the ball is thrown to him. In the modern era, we rely so much on three point shooting and it's clear how closely tied the mental aspect is to making shots from outside the arc. Once the Sixers went into flight mode, you can clearly see why they shot 3 for 21 from behind the arc in the second half. They had no rhythm, no confidence, and Doc had no ability to shake them out of this mindset, which is why there was no comeback. These kind of things happen, I get it, and a lot of responsibility needs to be placed on the players, but when you zoom out far enough, what you see are poorly coached teams who consistently get exposed for not making good decisions nor executing properly on both sides of the ball. And when you add to that the negative body language, 
overreactions to referees' calls, and problematic communication like telling your guys that the other team wants it more than they do, it's not surprising that we rarely see his stars play well in these situations and carry his team to victory. At some point, you've got to stop pointing your finger at the guys wearing the shorts and realize it's the guy on the bench. And with that being said, yeah, Doc, hopefully you get another opportunity, man. You know, if you still want to coach in the NBA, there's still opportunities available. You know, the Pistons are looking for a coach. I think that would be the perfect place for you. Detroit, you can coach Detroit Pistons, man. They'll be happy to have you.